Okay, our next presentation is by Michael Gill, Risky Business. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, first, I'm not going to use the mic, so I just want to make sure you guys can hear me in the way far back. Thumbs up, thanks. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you guys about some research I conducted this past summer looking at the effects of distance from shelter and resource availability on a herbivory and a coral reef. Um, so to begin, since the beginning of the discipline of ecology, trophic interactions including herbivory and predation have been widely accepted as fundamental drivers of community structure and function. This is true across ecosystems. And in 1966, Robert MacArthur and Eric Bianca introduced the concept of optimal foraging and spawned a body of theory that aimed to understand consumer decisions, and in particular, what they eat and what I'm most interested in, where they eat it. Boiled down very simply, optimal foraging sets the expectation that organisms want the most bang for their buck, or they want to maximize net energy intake. So from an optimal foraging perspective, being force-fed donuts while being physically restrained would actually be ideal. <laughs> But scientists soon realized that optimal foraging theory was missing a key piece of the puzzle, predators. And so additional theory was put forth that set the expectation consumers want to not only maximize their foraging rate, which we'll call reward, or F, but they simultaneously want to minimize their risk, or their rate rather, of serious injury or mortality, which we'll refer to as risk or mu. However, in natural systems, consumers can't get their way most of the time because these two demands are at odds. And oftentimes what we see is resource availability is correlated with predation risk. So what consumers really have to do is they have to balance risk with reward. And a simple way to model this is using the ratio mu over f. So risk over reward. And organisms should seek to minimize this in order to maximize fitness. So we know that resources drive f, but what drives risk? So to illustrate this point, I'll take a classic example from the literature and we'll go to Yellowstone Park. So here are some elk in a, a forest field interface. And here they're using the trees for shelter from predators. But as they move further away from the shelter of the trees and deeper into the adjacent field that's more rich in resources, they can increase their, their, their reward and potentially their fitness, uh, increase growth later on, they can reproduce more. But in some cases, taking on this added risk of being further from shelter can lead to predators taking advantage of the more vulnerable prey. <laughs> so, very sad. Very sad what happened to that elk. So, um, <laughs> what we see here is a foraging trade-off, um, balancing risk and reward, and it's driven by spatial habitat heterogeneity. And we know that spatial habitat heterogeneity, or landscapes of risk, are ubiquitous in ecosystems, both terrestrial on the top, including things like savannas and forests, as well as aquatic systems like seagrasses and mangroves on the bottom. And as this aerial photo demonstrates, tropical coral reefs are particularly spatially heterogeneous. And there's a great deal of variation in the spatial extent of the open sand flat habitats that you see among habitat, uh, reef habitat patches. Um, while we know that corals provide shelter from predators for a whole suite of organisms, and these predators can be both natural and not so natural, but um, what we don't understand very well is how isolation plays into this. Recent studies have shown that herbivorous fish will shrink their foraging range when there's an increased threat of predation, and that when moving among patches, herbivorous fish will often use reef as sort of corridors or um, uh, stepping stones to get from point A to point B. So we don't have a good understanding of how isolation affects herbivory, and we certainly don't have a good understanding of how perceived reward on the part of the consumer might play into this dynamic. So that led me to ask the following questions. First. How does reef habitat isolation affect herbivory, given that we know that things like reef fish are susceptible to predation? And second, does a greater reward elicit riskier herbivory? So if we increase the incentive to take risks, do we see consumers capitalize on that? So I wanted to ask these questions by addressing the following hypotheses. First, we can think of, um, this is reef on the left, sand flat on the right. As we get further from the reef, there's more risk of getting taken out by either a spear fisherman or a shark. So I expect that the further you are from a reef, if you're a fish, the less herbivory is going to happen. So my first hypothesis was herbivory decreases with patch distance from reef. So if we increase risk by increasing distance, but we keep the reward the same, I would expect herbivory to decrease with risk. Secondly, I expect that if you increase the reward, so we increase the amount of algae that these fish can eat, it'll lead to an increased amount of risky behavior because suddenly these consumers have a greater incentive to be risky. 
So to test these hypotheses, I conducted a field experiment on the island of Morea in French Polynesia. And the first task was to find sites that uh, had this reef sand flat interface characteristic. So I found three sites that were like this, reef on the left, sand flat on the right. And I first established an array. And I used artificial um, small patches, basically little cinder blocks. And I used as, these as anchors, and I put them out at five different distances. First, two meters inside the reef habitat, and then five, 10, 20, and 30 meters away from the reef habitat edge. And uh, I used distance as a proxy for risk, and I crossed this factor with a second factor, which I'm calling reward. So I had two different levels of reward. So at each site, I established two of these arrays I just described, and I randomly decided which one would get high reward and which one would get low reward. And how did I manipulate reward? So I attached macroalgae and turf algae to these cinder blocks using cable ties and clothespins. And the high reward units on the right in green received four times the amount of algae as the low reward units in yellow on the left. So this resulted in a 10 treatment design. And at each site, a given array received a low, a low reward deployment and a high reward deployment in random order. So I crossed these reciprocally and that led to a, led to a sample size of six. Um, so our response of interest was herbivory, so we used both uh, length of macroalgae and turf uh, algae cover loss as our responses. Um, we used four different species of common and palatable macroalgae, put them out at a set initial length, and then measured the change in length over time. We did the same thing by collecting cores from damselfish territories that had 100% turf cover, then we quantified the relative loss of that turf over time. So we returned to these, measured length of macroalgae, turf loss after 24 hours, we also had consumer surveys that we were able to capture with videotapes. So we videotaped a given uh, uh, array in, in a deployment for the first four hours. And I don't have these data yet. We're actually being analyzed right now. But the hope is that we'll be able to get foraging rates, herbivore diversity, densities, as well as predator abundance from these videos. And I just want to note, I'm not going to present the statistical models that I use to analyze these data. But I, just so you know, I use linear mixed effects models with um, nested random effects to deal with the multiple layers of nesting that I just described in the, in the kind of difficult design. Um, so if you want to talk about stats later, I'm happy to do that. So that brings us to my results. Uh, first, to answer the question, how does reef habitat isolation affect herbivory? I looked at the effect, the effect of distance from reef edge on the x-axis on proportion of macroalgal loss after 24 hours on the y-axis. And I did the same comparison for relative turf loss after 24 hours on the y-axis on the figure on the right. Uh, in both of these cases, we see what we expected, so a significant negative relationship between distance from reef and herbivory, and that's for both macroalgae and turf algae. So these data support my first hypothesis that herbivory decreases with distance from reef. So if we increase risk with distance and we keep the reward constant, we see herbivory go down. Uh, so to answer my second question, does a greater reward elicit riskier herbivory? So well, I looked at the effects of both distance, again on the x-axis, as well as reward. And this is uh, red dots indicating low reward, uh, black dots indicating high reward. Again, the response here is proportion of macroalgae loss. And what we see is interesting. So we see, again, the relationship, negative, significant negative relationship of distance on herbivory. But we see no statistical difference between the proportion of macroalgae loss for the high reward and the low reward units. So what this means is that when we increase the reward fourfold, we see a fourfold <laughs> increase in herbivory. And if we think back to the theory that I presented to you guys earlier, this mu over f ratio, what we did was we multiplied that resource availability by four. And what we ended up seeing was that there was four times the amount of what I'm referring to as risky herbivory. So it didn't matter what the distance was, herbivory increased fourfold. So these data also support my second hypothesis, increasing reward will lead to increased risky herbivory. And you can imagine that this risk could manifest itself in a couple of ways. One way would be that more individuals are visiting the higher reward units, or the same number of individuals are visiting the low, or the low reward and high reward units, but in the high reward units, they're staying longer and they're eating more. So I really hope to get it, parse out those two potential mechanisms with the video data. Uh, again, I don't have those, but I did want to at least give you guys a sneak peek. And the video's not working on here, so I'm going to do it manually. So this is an example of one of the units that's 10 meters away from the reef, and we have a zebrasomoscopus nibbling at turf algae there, then switching over to one of the macroalgae, 
and that's a typical herbivory event. If we look at that exact same unit, oops, just moments later, this is what we see. So there is certainly real risk in this environment. Um, okay, so for my conclusions, um, oops. So, um, this study demonstrated what we would expect. Distance from reef weakens herbivory, and this coincides with observations that have been made over many years of uh, grazing halos around reef habitats. Um, and this study also shows that herbivores may be balancing risk with reward as we might expect from an optimal foraging perspective. If we increase the incentive, there's a proportional increase in the amount of risk a consumer is willing to take. And I know that this is, um, you know, it's scaling up our experiments is always challenging. In this case, we're looking at small artificial habitat patches in these cinder blocks, but I think it's reasonable to infer that if you scale this up to larger patches of reef habitat, you can think of habitat isolation as having potential implications for reef resilience. And to explain this, I'd like you to shift your perspective to that of the algae for a moment from the consumer. So we know that nutrient pollution is happening all over the world. Pretty horrifying example there. <laughs> and we know that nutrients can increase the abundance of algae. They can stimulate algal growth or increase the reward from the consumer's perspective. And that these algae can elicit negative effects on corals and in doing so nutrients have indirect negative effects. Also, as the study just showed, consumers are heroes. They can come in and they can eat the algae. And in doing so, they can have indirect positive effects on the corals. So studies have shown uh, in the past that top-down control of macroalgae can often be so strong as to completely mask or counteract bottom-up control by things like nutrient stimulation. However, this study suggests that habitat isolation may weaken top-down control of herbivory and tip the scales in favor of more abundant algae. Even in reefs where fishing is not a problem and when the, the quality or the, the uh, reward magnitude is different in the eyes of the consumer. So the take home here is that habitat configuration can affect really important processes in the reef. And we may want to consider these when we think about ecosystem-based management in the future. And I would like to thank Craig Ozenberg, Julie Zill, Adrian Steyer, Leanne Jacobson, and my undergraduate video analysis team, the Algonauts, for their <laughs> many hours analyzing the 120 hours of footage that we got. And uh, this was funded by a couple of different sources. And thank you guys for coming, and I'll take any questions if I have any. Time for a couple questions? Yeah. So this type of study kind of takes on the assumption that um, foragers have some known knowledge of the patches. So I was wondering if you did something to acclimatize them to patches farther away um, so they have knowledge that all the resources are available. That's a good question. Um, not purposefully, but before this experiment, we ran just distance assays mm -hmm. with these same cinder blocks. So those cinder blocks were out there for probably four to six weeks okay. before these first assays were run. Um, so I think that that happened inevitably. And what we saw was a time effect too. And that's something I want to analyze more closely in the data. But just like you would expect, as they become more comfortable with this foreign object in the environment, they're more likely to approach it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you measure any gradual spray audience in the area that you were analyzing? So how many gradual you have to that sand patch? And if there is any difference between the Away, the right. Yeah, the question was, is there a difference in predator abundance at the different sites or at the different distances? I don't know that yet, but that's something I really want to try to get from the video data. And uh, so far we're seeing kind of more predator events than I expect, not actual predation, but the instance of a predator swing by the camera just like that shark. Um, so I'm hopeful we'll at least get a rough metric of pred relative predator abundances both across distances and then among sites. Okay, thanks a lot, guys.